Hi everybody, Dr. Kowser here. I uh, just wanted to put together a quick video lecture for you to talk about another movement within uh, the world of history, within the historiography of our uh, profession here, something you ought to be aware of, something that comes up fairly often as a very influential group of historians and a very critical way of thinking about history, and that is uh, what we call the Annals Movement of the Annalists. Uh, you may be able to hear from that, that uh, you'll see in the title of the video. It's a French word associated with the historical journal published in France, Annales, Annales d'Histoire Économique et Sociale. Um, so this is a school of French historians uh, that began working in the late 19th century and continued working through the 20th century in their journal. And the movement is uh, still alive and well today. You still have Annalist historians currently. Uh, since it's endured for so long, uh, the circle of historians and the school of thought around this journal has evolved through successive generations, which has had a lot of influence on the way that historians in other countries have thought about the task of history and have uh, taken a lot of uh, ideas and inspiration and influence from it. So this Anal school is very, very important. Um, where does it come from? Let's talk about that a bit. You may remember that when I spoke about uh, the beginnings of modern history or modernist history, in the 19th century. Uh, there was a lot of inspiration from science, a lot of ideas that were going to move away from a pre-modern literary approach to history and uh, focus instead on a history built on documents, right, to the sort of modernist history. Uh, Leopold von Ranke in Germany uh, was teaching students with this idea that they should study history wie es eigentlich gewesen war, which is German for the way it actually was. Okay, so for von Ranke and those who came after him, the idea to history was not to tell interesting and edifying stories about the past in order to inspire the new generation um, and sort of get them to be morally superior people. Rather, history was a scientific study that you got at by the systematic study of documents, especially government documents, and you use these as an evidence base to construct your theories, much as a scientist constructs a scientific theory for the way that human society acted in the past, right? The task of history was a kind of a social science in order to uh, determine what had actually happened in the past rather than a kind of literature intended to tell edifying stories, right? That's sort of the von Rankian uh, thing. Um, <coughs> in France, this idea was also uh, picked up, and there were a number of French historians who uh, also um, moved forward uh, this um, idea of uh, modern history. Uh, guys like Auguste Comte, uh, associated with the new concept of positivism, the idea that you can factually and accurately reconstruct the past from your documentary evidence. And uh, in France, the main institution, which sort of was the heart of this modern study of history, was the École des Chartes, which means the School of Charters, okay, the School of Documents, uh, which was a sort of a graduate program, an institute for training professional historians and future history professors in how to read these documents, how to read um, this kind of material and study it in a scientific von Rankian kind of a way. Um, that's where the first generation of analysts were trained. They were coming out of the École de Chartres and they were studying all of these government documents, right? Tax records, land records, judicial records, all this kind of, you know, very dry documentary kind of stuff. And they were very good at it, very intelligent uh, bunch of guys. Um, but at the same time, during the 19th century, you'll remember there's another movement coming along, a little more philosophical, which was starting to change uh, the way that people thought about history, and that was Marxism that I spoke about in an earlier lecture. Uh, Marx arguing that a lot of what you have in culture is a process of mystification, ways that the ruling class tries to justify its rule and keep the lower classes in oppression. Um, so Marxist ideas are floating around, and some of the historians at the École de Chartres um, are um, influenced by this. Some of them are actually becoming Marxist and adopting Marxist political philosophy. Others are not, but the ideas are still in the air and they have to talk about them. And they start becoming dissatisfied with what they're doing at the Echo de Chartres. Okay, they're starting to get dissatisfied with this constant uh, study of government documents. Why? Because they feel like what they're being asked to do is simply to document the activities of the ruling class and of the government, which is only a small powerful minority of people in the society and the people at the Echo de Chartres feel like they're starting to lose sight of what's going on with everybody else, right? Where's the other 90, 95% of the population that's not in the government if all that you're studying are these government documents all the time? So they start asking, is there another way that we can use these documents? Is there another way we can read this base of evidence and try to ask different kinds of questions, not just questions about what the government did and what laws were passed and what the tax policies were 
and this other kind of uh, um, question, uh, but can we instead get at the lives of ordinary people? Can we get at what's going on with um, the rest of the population apart from the small ruling elite? Um, and they start believing that they can, and ironically they start believing they can do this through the same government records, right? If you look at tax records, instead of asking how does the government go about collecting its taxes in a given period of time, they say, well, what can you tell about the economic lives of the people who are being taxed? You know, what are they getting taxed on? What are they making their living on? What kind of land do they own? What kind of trade? You know, this kind of a thing. How can you use the tax records, use the laws, use these other kinds of documents to get at the population that's not running the government? Okay, that's basically what the analysts set out to do. Um, what they proposed as an alternative model of history, instead of just saying we're going to do the history of governments, they proposed something that they called total history. Okay, histoire totale. Okay, let's do complete history, the history of everything. You know, can we look at a society in a given slice of time and try to understand everything that's going on, right? From the very bottom bedrock foundations of the society right up through and including the ruling class, can we put it all together in some sort of big overall picture rather than doing what we've been trained to do and just looking at the actions of governments. Okay, so that's what the analysts are about. You can hear the Marxist overtones there, right? You know, let's get at the history of the working classes. Let's get at the history of the proletariat. Let's get at the history of the peasants. Can we understand what these people were doing and not just, you know, the nobles and uh, governing officials who are ruling them? So that's the analyst uh, vision, uh, histoire totale, total history. Can you do the total history of a particular place um, in a, a particular period of time that you've chosen to study. Um, for some reason, I'm not entirely clear why, they tend to focus on earlier history. They don't go in much for modern history. Once you get to the year 1600, 1700 or so, the Annalists don't tend to pay much attention. They're much more interested in ancient history. A lot of them work in medieval history, so I, as a medieval historian, am particularly conversant with them in what we call early modern history from, say, around 1500 to 1600-ish. Um, one of the classic works of uh, this total history we're talking about was written uh, by one of the analysts, uh, Fernand Brodel, and uh, Brodel's uh, great magnum opus, his massive life's work, was a book called The Mediterranean in the time of Philip II. Um, and notice, by the way, it's, it's not Philip II and the Mediterranean world around him, it's a history of the Mediterranean and just happens to use this King of Spain, Philip II's rule, his, his reign as kind of the um, parameters for the years he's going to be looking at the Mediterranean in, but what he's really trying to write a history of is the Mediterranean, right? Not the rule of Philip II. Okay, that's sort of a classic example of total history. And if you look at this book, it's available in an English translation, two big heavy uh, volumes about, I forget how long they are, about, you know, a thousand pages each or something, uh, two very big hefty volumes. Um, not a thousand pages each, about five or six hundred pages each. Anyway, um, but these two big hefty volumes on the Mediterranean the way that Brodel structures it really is designed to illustrate this idea of total history. He doesn't start with King Philip II, right? He doesn't start with ruling classes or governments or wars or anything like that. He starts with the geography, and he spends a lot of time on it. He talks about the Mediterranean Sea itself, where the currents are, where the water is warm, where the water is deep, where it's shallow. Um, then he'll talk about the weather over the Mediterranean and how the sea affects the weather patterns and how you'll have the hot winds blowing northwards off the Sahara Desert across the sea and then getting up to Spain and southern France and Italy and places like that. He'll talk about the land around it initially without talking about the people who live on it, but he'll talk about the desert, he'll talk about the mountains, the seashores, uh, where the rivers are, where it's dry, where it's wet, where the rain falls, right? Hundreds of pages he's spending on these kinds of issues, right? So talking about the geography, not just in a few paragraphs to get it out of the way, but really building the story from the very earth itself. Okay, you know, starting with this geographic survey and this meteorological survey, looking at weathers and things, and building up, and then he'll start getting to the human population. But when he gets to the human population, he won't jump into talking about their governments or anything, or their culture, or their religions, or anything like that. He'll talk about how they relate to the environment, right? What kinds of ways, especially in the pre-modern world before industry, how do people make a living in this environment? You know, where can you fish? Uh, where can you herd sheep? Where can you farm? And where are the rivers that you can use for irrigation and for your water supply? Uh, things like that. So really sort of building up, you know, from the very rocks and the water of the sea itself to the way that the ordinary people make their living, and then gradually work up from that into 
their society, their culture, their economy, and then finally, halfway through volume two or so, you'll finally start getting into their government, their politics, their ruling classes, and finally King Philip II himself, right? Sort of as the capstone off of this much, much more in-depth study of all these sort of underrunning currents, okay? That's Annalise's history in a nutshell. That's total history, this idea of trying to encompass everything into a single study. Very, very difficult to do, and not many people, even among the Annalises, have managed anything on the same kind of scale since then, right? Because you need to know all sorts of different things from all sorts of different um, historical disciplines. But very, very inspiring idea, right? Can you bring together the history of everything um, into a single study? Uh, one metaphor you'll hear a lot from the Annalises is they'll actually use seas and oceans a lot as their explanation for how they think history works. They'll argue that in an ocean, when you look at it, Superficially, what you notice are the waves and the white caps on the top of the water, right? You go down to the beach and look at the water, you notice the waves come and crashing in. Um, they'll say that's like the government, you know, that's the rulers, that's the ruling classes, all sort of fighting their wars and conquering different lands, fighting battles and signing treaties and passing laws and doing all these things that governments do. But they say if you look at the ocean as a whole, all that frothiness on the surface is really very superficial and is not the main issue for the rest of the ocean, right? You have deeper layers of the ocean, the economy of um, the human society, in other words, you know, is a deeper level where there's a lot more water, you know, affects a lot more people than just the frothiness of the government uh, doing different actions and splashing around. And sort of the deeper underlying waves of the way that the ordinary people live, the way that the ordinary society gets along. And what the Annalise want to do is get at those deeper currents, those deeper levels um, that are not up on the top generating all the documents you find in the Ecole de Chartres, but that are, you know, down there much quieter, much darker, much harder to get at, but in the Annalise view, much more important. Okay, so that's uh, the sort of idea of total history. If you're ever reading along in history and someone talks about the Annalise, it brings up this concept of total history. That's showing Annalise influence, ultimately inspired by a certain degree of Marxism and um, not always necessarily used for Marxist political ideology, but um, inspired by Marxism to say, let's get away from just looking at what ruling classes do and start looking at what the whole society does and how the society fits into its environment. Okay, so that's very, very important, this idea of total history. Um, I should mention, by the way, one of the founders of the journal, Anal, that the Annalists published all their studies in, um, and uh, sort of establishing those ideas was a guy named Marc Bloch. Um, he was, again, French historian, despite the German name. Um, and uh, Bloch is a very interesting figure because he actually joined, he, he lived to uh, see World War II. He uh, started the studies, or lived anyway, in the late 19th century and early 20th century. Uh, but he lived down into World War II and um, uh, served on the French general staff uh, when the Germans were invading France. And then after uh, France was conquered by the Nazis, he actually joined the French resistance and was actively involved um, putting his commitment uh, to his country and to uh, the general people uh, into effect, and um, uh, served the resistance, fought against Germany um, as a member of the French underground, eventually was caught and executed in 1944. Um, so here you have a case of a historian who did not see his role in life as being uh, just a matter of going into the ivory tower, you know, going into musty library shelves and uh, researching people long ago. For Bloch, studying history was very much about studying life, about studying people, and he was very committed to it and very committed to his causes, and eventually gave his life um, uh, serving in the French resistance against the Nazis. So very, very important figure, uh, Mark Bloch, uh, B-L-O-C-H, if you want to look him up. He wrote a great book, by the way, called The Historian's Craft, which I almost assigned for this class. I highly recommend it, a very useful reflection on how historians work and think, and very uh, influential on my own uh, thinking and the way I teach this class. Okay. Um, so that's the first generation of the Annalists. Um, there were later generations, and in the second to third generations of the Annalists, once you get past World War II, um, there's a, one other very influential idea coming, coming out of the Annalists that's worth uh, mentioning, and that's mentalité. Okay, mentalité. M-E-N-T-A-L-I-T-E -E with an accent mark on the end of it, mentalité. Uh, often we just translate that as mentalities into English, Hard to get the exact nuance of the French word into English, though, but whenever, so you hear a historian saying they're thinking about mentalité or, you know, studying mentalité, 
They're referring again back to the influence of the Annalists. Um, this is associated with guys like Emmanuel Leroy Lagerie um, and uh, a number of other people. I uh, won't go listing all the French names for you, but I uh, can easily give them to you or email them to you if you're curious to uh, find some of these guys. Um, basically, the issue of mentalité was this. Um, like I mentioned, a lot of those early um, Annalists were either Marxist by their own political commitments or at least were inspired by the Marxist vision of history to want to do total history, to want to study um, the ordinary classes. Now the thing is that in Marxism, you may remember, there's an assumption that the economy is everything, right? Economics drive social class and politics are a way of securing economic benefits and everything else like culture and art and religion and all the rest of this stuff for a pure Marxist is just byproduct, right? It's just a mystification the ruling class has come up with to act as the opium of the people in order to maintain themselves in power, right? Marxists would argue it's not really worthwhile studying religion or studying art or studying culture. That's not the important stuff. It's the economics that's the important stuff. And you would only bother studying those other things in order to understand how the ruling class is manipulating them to you know, keep the lower classes in submission. Um, the second and third generations of Annalists, however, started having a problem with that idea. As they were sort of trying to get into the lives of ordinary people, they started finding an awful lot of culture, an awful lot of religion, an awful lot of you know, storytelling and art and all this kind of stuff, um, which couldn't simply be reduced to economic benefits or political manipulation. Okay, there was something else going on there. You know, even though they remained committed to this fundamental idea of um, you know, class divisions and the importance of economics. Uh, they also um, started to say that, you know what, there's something else going on here that shapes the way that people live, the way that people behave, the way that people uh, form their values and make their decisions and, you know, wind up uh, running a society the way they want to. And what mentalité came to be sort of the key word to capture what this other thing is. Um, the argument being that there's something going on mentally in people, there's something going on psychologically um, deep running patterns of thought and feeling and values uh, which you cannot simply boil down to economics or explain away. It's got a life of its own, it's got a history of its own, and therefore becomes worth studying as another manifestation of the lives of the ordinary people, the total society, um, the Annalise total historians want to get at. Okay? So um, this sort of you know, develops a whole new uh, feature from this idea of mentalité, this idea of studying the culture, the mentalities, the attitudes, the values of ordinary people. Not just intellectuals, right? Not just philosophers and theologians and you know, poets and novelists and people like that. You know, not just to sort of reproduce um, the culture of a ruling elite, but to start saying, okay, you know, what's the sort of undercurrent of thought and value and feeling and expression in the society as a whole, okay? Uh, even if you have to sort of turn to elite people and the evidence of elite people as an example of it, you know, can you get at um, through that at sort of these bigger, deeper running patterns of uh, behavior and thought and feeling in the society as a whole. Okay, so that's this idea of mentalité, not just the ideas of philosophers or intellectuals, but deeper running outlooks on life, worldviews kinds of things. Um, so, for example, uh, one of the analysts wrote a book called uh, Jacques Le Goff, a very, very influential uh, figure in the 60s and 70s into the 80s. Uh, Le Goff wrote a book on purgatory and the development of the idea of purgatory in the Middle Ages. And he wanted to argue this was not just a matter of uh, medieval theologians coming up with this new theological idea or developing an older Christian tradition or something like that. He was arguing there's something else going on where the European culture used to think in twos, used to think in terms of, you know, black and white, A and B in opposition to each other. And he argued that what was happening over the course of the Middle Ages where they were starting to shift from thinking in twos to thinking in threes, you know, black, white, and gray, you know, male, female, and something else in between, or whatever, you know, sort of no longer thinking in these binary oppositions, but starting to open up their thinking to the third thing that's neither A nor B, and he thought that purgatory was reflecting that. Very controversial book, you know, I'm not saying he was right or anything, but that's sort of an example of this idea of mentalité. You know, we're looking at something that's coming out in the writings of the intellectuals of the society, but we're using that to try and get at what we think are bigger, deeper shifts in the overall popular consciousness, you know, in the way the whole society is thinking about things. Okay, so that's sort of an example of mentalité. Um, and one idea, sort of the third idea, I gave you total history, I gave you mentalité. 
Um, third idea to uh, bring along here with the Annalise, which is related to mentalité, related to all of it, um, again, we usually stick to the French phrase, is la longue durée. Okay, the long durée, or the long duration. Okay, is the idea, the long-lasting thing. And here, what the Annalise were talking about, and here again, we're in that second to third generation, people like La Durie, like Le Goff, people like that. Um, excuse me. Uh, what they were getting at was the idea that just like in an ocean where you've got all this, you know, waves and froth moving around and changing all the time on the surface, that might be your politics and your wars and the sort of obvious stuff you look at when you start looking at historical documents. But mentalité, as well as economic patterns and social patterns, these sorts of things are the deeper levels of the ocean, and like the deepers of, of the ocean, they move much more slowly, they change much more slowly. Okay? Um, they would argue that the tendency to think in pairs, to think in dualities, for example, isn't something that just sort of comes and goes in and out in a given year or even in a given decade, but instead endures as part of the running sensibility of a culture for generations on end, maybe for centuries on end, you know, for hundreds of years at a time, the same way of traditional thinking will get passed down without anybody really even being aware of it, um, let alone trying to change or reflect on it or anything like that. Okay, so this idea of long durée, the idea that mentalité, the mentalities, the attitudes, the values, are enduring over very long periods of time. Okay, That's probably part of the reason why most Annalise historians avoid studying modern history so much. It's not a long enough time frame. You know, they like looking at hundreds of years at a time, you know, look over the course of the Middle Ages from, you know, 700 to 1300, or, you know, from ancient history, you know, in 200 AD down to 1200 AD. They like these big, long periods of time. If you limit yourself to just the, you know, 19th, 20th century, you don't have a big enough time frame to be able to detect long durée. You know, they want to find things that are much more enduring, much deeper lasting, because they assume that those are the more authentic realities of human experience for the vast majority of people. You know, the unchanging things, the very slowly changing kinds of things. Okay? Um, so like I say, the Annalise, there's still a fourth generation. There is a, what we call a fourth generation of Annalise now. They've kind of gone in a more postmodern direction and are moving, in, we've also talked about uh, previously. Um, but as far as the overall impact on the historical profession, the three concepts to bear in mind, First of all, total history, right? Not just doing the history of governments, but trying to do the history of everything in a given region in a given time period. Uh, mentalité, from the second and third generations of Annalise, the idea of using historical documents to get at these sensibilities and mentalities and attitudes that are held by large populations of people and that are held over, third item, the long durée, this very long time span, long duration in which these ideas and sensibilities change very slowly or not at all. Okay, so Annalise history, very, very important. Uh, tuck it away in your toolkit of sort of ways to think and uh, maybe inspiration to draw on as you go and do your own historical work or when you look at what the historians you're studying are doing. Uh, thank you.